What do you see as the greatest current challenge in global health? Oh, I think you know it'd be hard not to consider Ebola as as the as currently the most critical challenge, and it's it's the you know Samantha Power, the UN ambassador from the U.S., um, called it the greatest health crisis ever, and I think that's true. But it isn't the epidemic alone that's the greatest health crisis. The greatest health crisis is the fact that we have left behind a billion people on our planet who have no physical access to care. We've considered them market failures because they live in villages too small and they can't consume enough uh, product um, or medicine or cell phones uh, usage to make them meaningful consumers in today's market. Public sectors have left them out because they're hard to serve. The nonprofit sector have left them out because they're too expensive to serve. So the biggest challenge is actually what the cause of Ebola is which is the fact that, that uh, illness is universal and access to care isn't. And, and we've got to change that. And, and if we're willing to go the last mile to get health care to everyone, no matter where you live, no matter how small the village is, how far, uh, then I think we'll change that. But one of the things that Last Mile Health is doing is to create a new workforce in those villages to save lives in the world's most remote villages by giving village health workers all the things they need to perform like a professional worker. The equipment, the coaching from a nurse, the equipment in a backpack, the employment in the form of a paid regular contract, and trying to produce as many of these workers as possible. And so we've been doing that work for almost a decade now with the Liberian government, solving challenges like rural HIV treatment, solving challenges like access to pneumonia treatment for children, uh, access to hypertension diagnosis and treatment where it's never ever been done in the entire history of these villages. And now our major challenge, uh, in addition to the ones we've been facing, is to make sure that people with Ebola who are sick with it or might be sick with it are identified quickly in their home, referred into care that's adequate, not only adequate but high quality, and that those who are exposed to the disease get followed and supported in case they come down, get them quickly into care. Again, while keeping primary care services going, because again, most more people have died from that. Uh, from the lack of basic primary care services than even Ebola alone. And how do you make it sustainable, right? Because you're paying them salaries. Yeah. You have to pay for the training. Um, if you're paying for the supplies, yeah. you know, how do you make it sustainable? If you want, you know, great that you can, you know, put together a mix of philanthropy and donor dollars and all of that yeah. today. Um, and, and since you're partnering with the government, maybe there's a way to do it through that, though obviously sure. health budgets have been completely depleted with, with Ebola and whatnot, so... Yeah. How well, there's you, how more spending on health care now because of Ebola, uh, in the most immediate reason. There's also more spending after our war in Liberia. Between 2006 and 2010, government increased spending by tenfold. The, the challenge is when we spend our money and how well we spend it. So I would argue the cost of not doing anything in those remote villages in Guinea not investing tens of millions of dollars that we needed to blanket all of those villages with good professional community health workers tied to primary care clinics cost us now billions of dollars in the response to the failure of that. And, and so, uh, you know, it's not sustainable not to fund it, but how do you make it sustained within a system? Again, government alignment, the, the right commitments, uh, you know, there are revenue that the government takes in that can be applied to this. Some of these workers get paid $80 a month in their own village. $80 a month for a community health worker in a village in southern Guinea to treat that two-year-old with a fever or make sure he got the care and got diagnosed early or billions of dollars spent to try to chase an epidemic. Do you, think, do you think it's something that the governments will eventually be able to fund on their own? I, I think so, and we've seen some examples of that. In um, you know, there's still challenges, but there's some countries that are the, uh, are taking this on. The Ethiopian uh, government, for instance, has uh, has several tens of thousands of health extension workers. Again, also professionalized village health workers. They've been able to sustain that. Um, so, so we know this is possible, and we know that the governments like it. I mean, it's a great. In one intervention, you can. And not to fetishize community health workers, but in one intervention, you can save more lives than you've ever saved in places you've never reached. Get thousands more people 
who were out of formal education educated. So they become your future midwives, your future nurses. And you get a job creation program in countries like Liberia where the unemployment rate in rural areas can be as high as 85 percent. For both women and young men who are very, uh, a lot of countries are trying to employ in, in these rural areas. So healthcare, education, jobs, trying to assess the economic health and education impact of all that um, is an exercise I think we all ought to, ought to undertake, but I think the results would show that this is a really great return on investment.